What does it feel like for the person? Are there any psychological constructs that exist out there that would really encompass what this feels like when people are being creative? What's the closest thing? You know, when you have an insight, it pops into awareness in a way that's seemingly disconnected from the ongoing stream of thought because the brain had been working on that at some kind of unconscious level. Novices, when asked to be creative, they performed better. And the experts, it hindered their performance. Expertise may ultimately affect the types of cognitive processes and the way that we approach a creative task. One way to think of of insight, it's a way to leapfrog across complexity. If that's what insight is, it behooves us to figure out what the computational mechanism is and see if we can implement it in an artificial intelligent system. This is Brain Inspired. Hey, it's Paul. Just like you, I have been told that I'm creative. Yes, by my mother, a long, long time ago. (laughs) But also by a few other people along the way. And whenever that happens, I take it as one of the highest compliments that I could receive. There's a little problem, though. Uh, Like intelligence, I don't really understand what creativity means. (laughs) I think I know it when I see it. But I also know that different people are creative in different ways. There seem to be different modes of creativity and so on. So we have a bunch of questions. How does creativity come about? How do our brains implement creativity? Are there a few underlying principles that would help us create creative machines? Those are the kinds of questions that we discussed today with John Cunios and David Rosen. So John runs his creativity research lab at Drexel, where they study these kinds of questions. He's also written a popular science book about creativity uh, and about insight specifically. Um, That's called The Eureka Factor, Aha Moments, Creative Insights, and the Brain. And David was a graduate student in John's lab, and he has gone on to form the company Secret Chord Laboratories, where their work overlaps with the study of creativity, although they're focused on what exactly in music makes us enjoy it, and what that means for how music evolves over time. Uh, On the episode, we cover all of this, basically. Um, We talk about the current state of the study of creativity and how we got to this point. We talk about conscious versus unconscious processes uh, related to creativity and insight. John and David have published a series of studies together, uh, which uses jazz improvisation as a way to study creativity. In particular, we talk about comparing the performance and the brain activity between experts and novice uh, jazz musicians while they improvise. And it turns out that the way that you're creative and the brain circuits employed when you're creative depend on your level of expertise. And there's a a dual process model uh, that helps explain what's going on there. So these are the early days in the neuroscience of creativity, but uh, we're beginning to open that door, or at least John and David are. And we end up speculating a bit uh, about what it might take to build creative machines. Learn more in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 104. Okay, two quick things before we start here. Number one, I messed up because of a little series of technical issues. Uh, I ended up recording accidentally through these cheap headphones instead of my normal setup. So I sound terrible. However, John and David both sound great. So apologies, lesson learned. So I hope it doesn't distract too much. The other quick thing, I was talking with Megan Peters, who helps head up the Neuromatch Academy and conference, if you're privy to that. Uh, And she reminded me that originally today would would have been the last day to register for that. But it's a few weeks in the summer where they do like a really deep dive into computational neuroscience and uh, deep learning. But the application uh, deadline for that academy has been extended one week. So from today, May 7th, um, you have until May 14th to uh, register. So again, you can check that out at neuromatch.com. I O. Thanks for listening. If you like the podcast, don't keep it to yourself. Tell a friend. Here are John and David. Enjoy. Let's just start this thing off. I just want to um, tell you guys to 
be creative while we're, we're uh, recording this podcast, okay? Be creative. Oh, no. <laughs> this will come up a little bit later here. Um, so I actually have a few. You're both musicians, and I have a few questions about music and jazz specifically. I appreciate jazz. I like to play my in my limited way. I like to play jazz scales and try my hand at jazz. I feel, however, like jazz is more for the player than for the listener. And I'm wondering uh, what you guys think about that notion. David, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. I'm not, not sure if I completely uh, agree with that, but I think there's there's important um, you know aspects for both the performer to think about and the audience. And also, I think the the interaction that happens there. So, I mean, like anything, music, jazz, or really any performing art, or anytime you're you're speaking to anyone, it's really important to understand the kind of the audience. And so, you know, the, the the composition of that audience. You know, there are many people who you know go to the jazz clubs regularly and have a deep understanding of what's happening during the show. And that can be in, in a number of different forms. It can be from an audience recognizing uh, like a classic lick from a standard that's been played for you know 50 plus years. Or it could be noticing that um, a certain player in, in the ensemble is doing something that's, that's new or surprising. Or it could be just noticing, as if I'm an audience member, the interactions that are happening live between the members on stage that seem to be having at points at sometimes like inside jokes between one another. I think that might be kind of the the more uh, colloquial kind of idea of most music listeners when, when you hear jazz. It's like, that really sounds different and I don't really get what's happening. And I think like any kind of specific <laughs> niche, specific niche, it's really, um, it's about having that deep knowledge and, and conceptual understanding of, of those inside jokes and to understand the phenomenon of what's, of, of kind of what's going on. On the improviser side, again, it's, it's about context. So, you know, if you're, you're playing to that small jazz crowd or if you're maybe you're at a more, you know, a different type of audience that's more broad, for example, that is in that crowd, you, you may have a different of uh, engagement by the way that people are watching you. And then the way that people respond is, is going to impact kind of in, in some ways the way you're playing. And so as a music, I'm a musician, I'm not necessarily a very good jazz musician, but you know, through rehearsals, there's definitely that inside, those inside jokes that are happening. Yeah. And that really, the interactions between each other is really what I like to come back to. It's like when you rehearse something over and over, and maybe like something silly happens at band practice, or like, and you just like start riffing off this idea, and it goes out into somewhere where you never even like kind of thought it would. And then maybe someone like teases that idea during a song, and everyone looks at each other, and, and maybe the audience doesn't really have, have a grasp of what's happening there. So I think there's a balance. Like, like anything, to have the deepest level of appreciation for something, it's about having the context um, that takes it just beyond just kind of thinking it as music more broadly or as a backdrop for kind of where you are that evening. See, if that I, makes sense. John, what do you think? Because I think he was just describing appreciation and not uh, more, a more visceral enjoyment uh, as a listener. Right. So then I, the reason why I was asking is because I can, you know, go off on some jazz thing and I'm super engaged in it, right? But the person listening would either be would, would be horrified because it's me playing. But even if it was like, you know, Charlie Parker or something, might not get it. They, they don't feel like they get it as much. You might have to have that understanding of j the jazz, the sound or something. John, w w w yeah. maybe you should weigh in. Yeah, I, I think I think it varies across performers and across audiences a lot. So uh, let me let me put aside jazz for a moment and talk about what I know a little bit better, which is classical music. So okay, sure. take the uh, the great pianist Glenn Gould, right? Um, he was a great concert pianist, and but he hated performing for people. He hated going to performances. He just hate, he thought that performances were blood sport. They were <laughs> demeaning. Um, so he quit at a young age. He quit the, the, the concert circuit and just made recordings. And really, he was just doing what he wanted to do. He was experimenting with music. He was playing music the way he liked to hear it. And I don't think he really cared much what anyone else thought of it, except that, of course, he wanted to sell records to support himself. So th that's a certain type of performer. Other performers, they, they live to please the audience. I can't hear you. How you feeling? Yeah, I mean, they, they, 
the, the the pleasure they get is from the feedback from the audience. Glenn Gould didn't care about that feedback. He got the pleasure from uh, performing the way he wanted to hear it. Uh, so I think, and I think they're in terms of going to, to concerts or uh, listening to music, whether the downloads or CDs or whatever, I think some people are deeply, deeply into the music. And other people do it, they get their rewards somewhere else. Their rewards are being a part of a social community of, you know, jazz listeners or devotees of a p- particular performer. So there are lots of reasons to perform. There are lots of reasons to listen. And I think everybody gets their, their pleasure or their reward in a different way from a different place. You just had to diffuse all the tension right there and make everyone happy. That's yes. <laughs> Because we're going to be talking about expertise and its interaction with creativity today, um, I, I've noticed, and this is not just in music, but in, also in, in music, uh, professional musicians, when they're asked what their favorite piece is that they have created, it's almost never their most popular work, right? They always um, say, you know, and tied, tied to that, it's also after they've um, gone to rehab and gotten over the drugs, they say they're making their best music, you know, but not to the popular audience or to the critics' ears. And I'm wondering if you have any um, insight uh, as to why, why that might be. The, if, first of all, if you agree with that, if I'm accurate in that uh, observation. And secondly, why that might be the case that artists, I think painters alike and just broadly artists, uh, there's that phenomenon where they, just, they have a different um, idea of what their best work is. Uh, might be, but well, it it could be as something as simple as what an artist thinks is their best uh, creation is something that pushes the boundaries of the genre and is harder for other people to understand because of that. Um, and things that that are not genre pushing uh, are not as popular because there are fewer people that understand mm-hmm. it. it. It could be something that simple. You mentioned you mentioned a very specific example of you know maybe a, a dark era where potentially drugs are involved, and then you know a, an individual makes it through those really trying times, and on the other side of that, what they have found is personal um, a different level of personal happiness and feeling of like a meaningfulness of the music um, for them. And you're right; I think this goes back to like in terms of how that's resonating with the audience. To me. When you when you break down what makes really creative art um, important and powerful is the ability to um, deliver a true emotional experience and feeling to other people that is like so deep and, and unique and to conjure that emotion. And so I think actually in that dark place, it seems to be that there's there's this kind of relationship with creativity that especially with with in music and in the arts. You tap into you're tapping into something that is like dark and and very, but it's like authentic. It's just like authentic and like unique, kind of like strife of the artist. And that and when people seek creativity and seek art, oftentimes they're looking for something that like resonates with a piece of themselves that evokes something out of them that maybe they couldn't get anywhere else. Um, and maybe that artist isn't producing that same kind of work um, mm-hmm. on the other side of of what we would call psychological well-being, I think. Right. Um, and then the, le- the other piece was, you know, we always have, I have a joke that with my friends, we're all making music all the time. And we say, what, what's the most creative piece or, or what's the best one? And it's always like the, the track that we're working on yesterday. Of course. Mm-hmm. It's, the track, it's the newest track. It's the newest track you make because yeah. it's for the artist. I think it, it really is leaning into, you know, I've done these steps to get here. And now the next thing that I'm making is ultimately a coalescence of these creative pieces or, you know, tricks that I picked up along the way. And now I've landed here to making this thing. Do you think this, the same is, uh, occurs in science? <laughs> I don't know about maybe our darkest moments, <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah. I, I think. Well, let, let me let me step back for a moment. I think also in some cases, uh, a, a musician's a composer's greatest composition is something they did a while, or, or most popular composition is something yeah. they did a while back. So they're doing something now which they think is better, but other people like the things that came before. So the implication is, you think I've gone downhill? No, I haven't gone downhill. This is better than what I did before. So an example would be Beethoven's Seventh Symphony was recognized universally as a great symphony. Then he wrote the eighth, which is shorter, and it's it's, uh, uh, arguably not as uh, deep, but people thought it was fluff at the time. 
And Beethoven said, no, the eighth is much, much better than the seventh. You don't understand it, you know, and he, he got very angry because I, I think at least in part because he didn't believe that he was going downhill and he wasn't. His greatest compositions lay ahead of him uh, at that time. So mm-hmm. uh, so I, I think it's, it's – uh, some composers view that as uh, almost an insult or or as a, uh, you know, oh, poor Beethoven, he's, he's sliding, he's slacking <laughs> off, he's getting old and weird and, you know, that kind of thing. Now, in terms of science, uh, the quality of the science is often more objective. Um, not always. I mean, there are certainly scientific breakthroughs that are not truly understood for years to come. But if you did an experiment and you got an outcome and it proves some point, it doesn't matter whether anybody thinks it's beautiful or not, uh, as long as it's useful. Certainly, if people think it's beautiful, it will it will become famous in in the popular mind as well, or it's more likely to anyway. So I think science is a little bit different in that sense. In music, there's no objective way to say one piece is better than another. It's you know, do people like it? Do people who know music like it and do they like it over a sustained period of time so that it has staying power? Whereas in science, you know, that's less of an issue. All right, good. This this kicks us off. We've already touched on multiple things that we're going to talk about here. So I really went down the rabbit hole um, in, pre- in preparation for this interview, um, reading all about creativity and the neuroscience of creativity. You know, not only your works that we're going to focus on here, but uh, just... <laughs> sort of the history and um, boy, it's so there are two things that I've kind of taken away from that. One, it seems a little bit like the Wild West right now in the neuroscience <laughs> of creativity. And maybe you can dispel me of these notions, but you're laughing right now. So, but, but in one sense, that's a good thing. If that's true, in one sense, that's a good thing because it means that there's a lot of work to do. In another sense, you know, it's it's a bad thing because it, it means that there's potentially a low signal to noise ratio in what counts, you know, as, as good science and how to, how to figure all these things out. The other thing that I recurringly thought, so we, we did an episode here recently on the show about um, cognitive ontologies, like uh, cognitive functions, like working memory. Is that a real thing? How is it related to attention? How is it related to long-term memory? And like, where does it fit in the structure of all of our cognitive functioning? And creativity, it's a big word. It seems to ride on top of other constructs there are also very active areas of research uh, in neuroscience and, and cognitive science. <laughs> Just, and, and so I, I don't know what that means uh, about studying it in the, in the nitty gritty neuroscience fashion that is, has been happening now for you know, a decade plus. So I, I kind of wanted to just put those thoughts out there and, and ask you broadly where, where we are, you think, in the science uh, of, and uh, in our understanding of uh, creativity. Well, I, 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 yeah, I have to jump in on it because when I was looking through the list of uh, potential questions that you sent, yeah. and I made a few notes for them, and with regard to that question, all I wrote in in, in a note was Wild West. Wild West. <laughs> Wild so West. So it's ex- okay. exactly exactly the phrase you used. So yes, that that's exactly. So here's here's the situation. Uh, creativity research arguably began scientific research on creativity. In 1950, when uh, Paul Guilford, who was already a famous psychologist for his work on intelligence, turned to studying creativity. And he was uh, elected the president of the American Psychological Association, and he gave his inaugural address, and he talked about creativity. And that really was the beginning of, of, I mean, there were people who dabbled before that but that's really kind of the beginning right there. It was like the mandate to say, okay, let's do this. Yeah, it was a him? call to arms. Yeah. And he didn't really have any data in, in that talk, but he, uh, he described some ideas that would lead to studies. And then he got a, a grant from the Office of Naval Research in the 1950s, and he started doing the research that he was describing. And that, uh, that really got things going. But uh, the problem, here's the problem with creativity research. The field, it, it's really started to take off in the last arguably 20 years or so with the addition of a neuro, the neuroscience approach. Yeah. So you start with, with Guilford and his, his approach. He took the, the approach he had used from uh, intelligence research, looking at individual differences 
in, in uh, creativity. So you have individual differences. You have people studying, um, coming from a personality research tradition. You have people coming from a social psychology tradition, uh, people coming from an economic perspective, looking at innovation. You have neuroscientists, you have cognitive psychologists. They're, it's a tower of Babel. They each have their own language. They have their own ways of studying, their own paradigms, both intellectual and experimental. They don't necessarily agree on a definition of what creativity is. So it is very much a Wild West. Now that is good and bad. The, the, the bad part is that a lot of people are sort of uh, talking across purposes. They're not really communicating uh, and that, that makes it very difficult. Uh, on the other hand, this is an exciting time in the field because it's start. It's just starting to gel. Yeah. It's starting to gel. And if you brought up the field of memory research. Well, memory research has been around since the 19th century. And uh, a lot of the methods we use today are still from the 19th century. They're newer methods, of course. But the study of memory is a mature science. Everyone agrees on the the concepts, the terms, the methods, etc., and it's kind of a uh, a race to employ these methods quicker, better to learn more, and sort of the, you know in, I'm sure some memory memory research will disagree with me, but it's sort of like in certain areas of biology where uh, everyone knows what the next step is, who can get there next, who can get there first, and and uncover things, who's got the biggest best funded lab to uh, get things done quickly. Whereas in creativity research, it's the Wild West. Uh, there, there isn't much in the way of resources because it's not a, um, uh, a well-defined field yet that, that such that funding agencies and foundations have identified, say, neuroscience of creativity as a field that they're going to pour resources into. Uh, so it's really you know, a matter of who's got the best ideas that will last the longest. And with the, the other bad ideas sort of dropping out as time goes by and people sort of coalescing around a particular way of looking at it and a particular way of thinking about it. So, yes, Wild West, absolutely. I'll add a little bit to that. Um, not too much. That was really well said, uh, John. So when I started graduate school, um, you know, I, I kind of had a, a vision. It was, it was, I had a vision of what I wanted to look into. And it was, and I came kind of at it where I, w I had been improvising for years. I was very much into the, into the music. And one of my first tasks, the first day, the first year when I started, when I started in graduate school was literally like to read all, just like, you know, do a deep, deep dive of like all the different ways that we do try to define creativity, um, through different assessments. And, what what I saw in terms of standardized ways to try to to try to understand how people are creative are very different from one another in terms of even how we start to define it. So I, I would break them up into two kind of categories. There's your classic uh, along the lines of Guilford and Torrance. There's your classic divergent thinking tasks, which basically ask people, you know, here's here's an object or come up or, or, or here's a problem. Come up with as many different solutions or ideas as you can um, that would that you could like, for instance, use a brick for or use a paperclip for. Um, that's one. And so divergent thinking isn't necessarily creativity in itself, but it's one aspect of creativity, right? It's coming up with, um, you know, a lot of different ideas. It's ideation. It's the generation of, of different, um, ideas that may seem very closely connected or may seem very dis disparate from kind of the task at hand. Then there's the other side of creativity assessments, which is long, along the lines of convergent thought. Which is a single solution, um, like a lot of John's work on Insight focuses on about a remote associates test, for example, where you come up with, you know, one solution that could combine, you know, one that I like is where there's three words, and then you uh, you try to find the word that would complete them all into a compound word. Um, the example we always use is crab sauce and pine apple i know this because you always oh. use the example <laughs> oh there you go so we i'm always... just a really good good divergent right. convergent thinker perfect there you are you're high, you're very creative or but so what you just did also is another part of kind of as i was looking through the literature that i didn't see a lot of work in in neuro understanding creativity from a psychological perspective or a neuroscientific perspective is even 
especially on the divergent side, especially even when you give a solution that seems novel. Um, so the way those solutions are generally rated, we break them down and there's like a fluency. There's the number of number of ideas that you would give. And then there's flexibility, the number of distinct categories of thought. And there's originality, which is how novel that is. And a lot of times um, like you can think about the different ways you can have, you know, raters rate them for novelty. Or you could just take like a statistical, say, 5% of people gave this answer or less. So we'll call it novel. There's different ways to measure that. Right. But if I have two. One of the things I came back to was like, if I have two people or three people who gave the same answer for something, um, and one of those people, let's say I use a brick for whatever, I use a brick to sit on around a campfire. And one person went camping last weekend and sat on a brick at the campfire. Well, like that process that's underlying um, how, what the, what the end product was, um, is really kind of not differentiated. Um, in terms of if, if I'm just giving responses and I'm looking at the neurological response of that, um, I feel like there hasn't been much work really, really diving in there. Um, and so for me, I saw all these different kinds of standardized assessments of creativity, and I felt like the best way to assess creativity would be to look at a specific domain and then to start to look at, you know, domains that would be close to that thing and start to look for overlapping neural activations and patterns of patterns of thinking like throughout different domains that could be you could say okay this is like these are consistent with music performance this is consistent with dance maybe this is consistent with art but when we boil it down we see these commonalities um in terms of creative performance and so i've tended to stay away from the standardized assessments for better or worse and try to approach kind of one field and get a sense of of creativity there and compare it to other people doing work in other uh, specific domains you mentioned, um, you know, you had this like, these ideas going into graduate school. Did you have, uh, were you going to always be an entrepreneur? <laughs> oh, man, we're, going, we're, we're taking a turn. Yeah, no. but we'll get back. We'll get back. But so you run Secret Chord Laboratories. Yeah. You co-founded Secret Chord Laboratories. And so we'll we'll take a side side road here sure. for a minute. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I okay. never, I never set out. To, I never set out to be an entrepreneur when I started to do the research. So the, the work for Secret Chord Laboratories is very related to, I was doing music production and I met my co-founder. He came to my, we always joke that he came to my, uh, I had two great advisors in grad school. I had uh, John, who was my psychology and cognitive neuroscience advisor. And I had uh, Youngmoo Kim, who was an electrical engineer, um, who was my advisor at a place called uh, the Music Entertainment Technology Lab at Drexel. Before Spotify and Pandora and basically before you know the big companies came over and took over all this uh, music information retrieval research, which is basically like taking an audio signal and breaking it down and understanding certain properties of it in terms of uh, musical content. He was like that lab was sending, you know, but the engineers were going to places like Grace Note from Nielsen or like Spotify. And so he had all these like people who were like understanding the signal there. Um, I was the first psychology recruit into that lab because he was, well, he was sort of kind of from the MIT Media Lab and he saw like this value in interdisciplinarity. And so he's like, okay, well, music is really, if you're not understanding the brain you're, you're, and the perception of music, um, if I'm going to have a music entertainment technology lab, I'm missing a huge component. So I was lucky that I was in, I, I was in Philadelphia at the time. I was a teacher, actually. I was, I was teaching sixth grade. Um, oh. and my best, one of my best buddies who I'd been in a band with for 10 years, he was an engineer in this lab and he, I was like living with him and he was, he said, Hey, there's this opportunity to, it's like interdisciplinary position between the ACBS program, the applied and cognitive brain sciences with in psychology and then the music entertainment technology lab. Are you interested? And so that's how it started. And my co-founder, Scott Miles, he, he came to my lab one day looking for the perfect complement to his neuroscience research on music enjoyment. So that work goes back. That started with uh, Leonard Meyer going back in 1956 with uh, Music and Meaning, where he outlined basically this, these ideas of tension and release, ultimately leading to feeling emotion in music. And then we joke that he had found the perfect engineer. He found the perfect guy for the project. Um, and then that guy left and he took a job somewhere in San Francisco and he got stuck with me, someone with the same exact skill set that he had. Okay. <laughs> yeah, not not the not not the desired uh, potential for a uh, a super duo forming a company. Yeah, it wasn't uh, to, to start. It was two neuroscientists who were music geeks, both musicians, and then so basically that work was we wanted to empirically test um, this idea that you know 
tension and release, and ultimately the tension is surprise in music, that we could quantify surprise and say that in the most popular songs ever, the Billboard charts, um, there is something quantifiably and empirically different between the top performing songs of all time and those that were not as high charting, is how the, the research really started. And me being the, the cynic you know, music guy that I was studying music production was like, yeah, right, Scott. Like (laughs) there's so many, there's so many variables, like, you know, how attractive is the musician or like how much, which label was backing it or, you know, so many different, so many different pieces. And so we continue to do that. We started to do that work and we statistically showed that those top songs we're looking at harmony only to start had more harmonic surprise. But that was the start was a statistical analysis of past music. And then we took that and did a behavioral study with algorithmically generated music and gave that to subjects with uh, harmonic surprise modeled after those songs that we had analyzed from over it was about 33 years of pop music uh, from Johnny B. Good to Smells Like Teen Spirit from 58 to 91 was the initial research. Um, and then we both graduated and uh, you know, we went our went our different ways, and I, I started to teach psychology, and I was looking for jobs. It was a one year position, so I was looking for jobs. I actually had just taken a job at Wesleyan uh, as for a one year visiting gig two weeks earlier, and Scott calls me up. This is about a year or year or so after we graduate, and Scott says, "Hey, we just got accepted into Project Music. It's a Google for Startups uh, music tech accelerator. We're gonna make a business out of this." That's really how I ended up becoming an entrepreneur, and and you know, do, been doing that for the last two years. You actually learned some useful useful skills in uh, in your education, huh? <laughs> I did. I did learn some the Not skills from of me. <laughs> the skills of definitely definitely from John. <laughs> so you're using the neuroscience of creativity and uh, analyzing songs and uh, using that as a service to help people decide what's gonna what's gonna bring enjoyment to people's lives. Right. I would say it is as directly connected to. There, there is overlap. I like to, uh, in, t- in terms of that the neuroscience of creativity. When I think about the dual process model, that um, we haven't gotten there yet, mm-hmm. but when we talk about dual process model, which in a way is like kind of based on um, our two memory systems, which with Kahneman and Tversky have laid out in terms of like system one, which is like your your unconscious, you know, highly efficient. A kind of like automatic system that's underlying things as you, you know, you, you kind of learn habits and you interact with your world and you learn how to behave in certain situations just like automatically, right? And you have your, your second system, memory system, system two, which is more effortful and uh, attention. You need focus. Um, and it takes up more cognitive resources. And, you know, we talk about that in terms of creative production on the side of, you know, when do you need to, when do you need to turn things off and zo- and kind of like, you know, lose control? And there's other times when you when you might such as making a mistake or tripping up or you're not familiar with the tune where you need to um, you know, be more effortful. So when we think about things in those two systems, ultimately, the work at Seeker Chord boils down to a key metric um, that we have quantified. And now we have patents pending on, which is called familiar surprise. Mm-hmm. And so surprise um, is ultimately a measure of entropy, uh, Shannon entropy at different different orders, right? So basically, given a corpus of music, music that's happened before, um, that's out in the world to, to listeners' ears, um, you know, from the time you're in the womb, you're developing expectations in your culture and your society of like what sounds go together. So familiar surprise that does is, is okay, so that those two components um, really map onto nicely the same systems that are key to creativity. Right. So there's surprise, um, which is that first system. It's it's unconscious. It's kind of like how our brains, you know, we track statistical regularities in our environment, but we don't do so in a conscious in a conscious way. And so we want a certain amount of surprise in terms of the new things that we hear. Right. We've, we established that in the with secret cord in the statistical analysis and the research and then in a behavioral study. And now we've done it like looking way beyond just songs from the past and just harmony. And we're looking now at, you know, melody, rhythm, timbre, texture and dynamics. We have these and harmony, those six features. And we're looking at surprise on the song level across all of those features. And so what you see, so on that surprise, okay, so that's like the unconscious part is mapping out surprise. But if you just had surprise, going back to like when we were talking about jazz, right? Maybe you you pick something out and to you at that moment, it's like the most creative thing that you could do, right? But if you have too much surprise, like if I give an acid jazz song to a pop listener, <laughs> right? Well, that's not grounded 
right? That's not grounded in familiarity, which is ultimately what I would think is that second system. It's it's what we're conscious of. It's the songs that we can sing from you know our memory. It's the songs that we have we have deep emotional connections to. It's the songs that we identify with because a lot of especially in the popular music and commercial commercially viable music we think about like you know if you ask someone, I ask Paul, what's your favorite? Uh, when do you think the best music was ever made? Uh, whenever, you, how much is that doggy in the window was written? <laughs> is that is that your favorite? No, music? But I was going to ask you if, if the beach where the Beach Boys are in your. I don't know. I'll go Hendrix. I'll go that era. Okay, and and how old were you when when uh, oh, you, when uh, you of discovered? Course. I know where this Hendrix. is going. Yeah. So when I was uh, uh, listening to Electric Ladyland over and over, I was probably fifteen. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, that's, and I think that's where the, the familiarity and the meaning and the emotional associations are grounded, right? So from a certain era, there's certain music that's played and that we have, we, you know, that's the reason why we can listen to songs over and over. When I talk about surprise, usually the first questions I get is like, well, then how can you explain the fact that um, we listen to this, that people listen to the same songs throughout their whole life? Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll talk to, and I'll speak to a different, I answer that with a different phenomenon. I say, well, you can do that because when you're optimizing both of those memory systems and hijacking them, that there are things in those songs that are surprising given the entire corpus of music, but these surprising moments you are familiar with, mm. right? So it's like kind of this idea of, you know, you get off when you're at a concert and you know something like really crazy is going to happen and you you might nudge the person next to you and like tell them to prepare. There's this part of like, no, there's this like anticipatory knowing yeah. of the surprise. And then the other piece is like, if you look to your grandparents or even your parents or a generation, um, we have found with your secret chord is that these patterns of surprise aren't static. So over time, you need more and more surprise. And we have an upcoming paper that's going to be published uh, this month about the effects over time. That it's those top, the difference between top and bottom performing songs, they diverge in, in mm. terms of you need more and more surprise, almost like a drug to get the same effects. And so as you keep having, as culture evolves and music evolves because it's a part of culture, the, the music that becomes popular is almost, uh, it's, it can't even be recognized as music to people who appreciated music two decades, three decades, four decades ago. And that's why you get that thing of it's like, this doesn't even sound like music anymore. And like eventually, you know, that's and that kind of phenomenon occurs like over and over. John, I'm pretty old. You might be a couple years older than me. Are they just whippersnappers doing, uh, making racket these days? What's going on? With <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm a lot older than you, bro. I'm sure of it. <laughs> hey, you got so, my uh, How Much Is That Doggy in the Window reference, I think. So. Uh, yeah, I, I got that. I, I know that song. <laughs> when uh, was that written? The, 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 oh, <laughs> Probably 1930s, uh, 20s. I don't, yeah, I don't know. A long time ago. Um, I don't go that far back. You know, the music I listened to was written hundreds of years ago. So generally, so uh, you know, the, I, I think what Dave is uh, describing uh, applies to uh, popular music, except in as much as there's there's a a phenomenon in classical music where uh, people tend to cling to the specific performances or recordings uh, that uh, were their first, they were first introduced oh, to a work. Yeah. So there's a whole, there's a whole genre in uh, classical recordings of, of sort of these uh, nostalgia reissues of performers, you know, recordings that were recorded in the 1950s and 60s, or whatever. Uh, and it may have been the first performance a person heard of, say, Beethoven's Fifth or Mahler's First Symphony or something like that. And people do tend to cling to those. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that may be a, uh, a similar thing. Uh, but in terms of upping the ante, coming up with more and more surprise, that's clearly the case over hundreds of years in classical music as well to become, you know, more and more extreme to the point where the, the, the surprise is no longer a factor because everything is so extreme that the surprising thing would be for it to not be surprising mm. or extreme. Well, let's segue here. And I want to, cause I want to bring in the Eureka factor book and your work on insight, John, before we get into the, the, you know, creativity, larger, the larger question of creativity and the neuroscience of it. I mean, I'll just ask you, what, what is the relationship between creativity and insight? And, you know, what are some of the features of, of insight as opposed to just creativity more broadly? Okay, so insight, as defined by experimental psychologists, is any 
sudden realization. It could be the solution to a problem. It could be a new perspective, a new idea. Um, but the, the emphasis is on the sudden part of the realization. So often, uh, and another term for it is the aha moment. Now, in the popular jargon, the term aha moment is a little more general. So when people talk about aha moments in colloquial speech, they often mean any deep understanding that they've achieved of something. Uh, the definition in experimental psychology is more specific. It has to be sudden. You, you, things snap into place all of a sudden and you see things in a new light. And the study of insight began, oh, back around the time of World War I by the Gestalt psychologists in Germany who were, who noticed this phenomenon in perception. You could look at a visual illusion or an ambiguous figure and then suddenly see it reverse and see it in a different way. And they started applying that to problem solving. And they realized that often you're stuck on a problem. And then all of a sudden you realize you've been thinking about the problem in the wrong way. And that aha moment then shows that the solution of the problem is actually simple. You had made it more complicated than it needed to be, perhaps because you were distracted by irrelevant features of the problem or whatever. Uh, so what insight is, it, it's a mechanism that the brain has for making something that is not obvious, obvious. And it it's uh, that change of perception or of representation happens suddenly. And it has a certain force. Uh, often there's a, uh, a feeling of emotion associated with it. A person may have an emotional rush. Oh, now I see it, see it the way it really is. Uh, it also comes with a feeling of certainty and obviousness. Once you've, you've restructured your idea of the problem or the, the, the situation, it's like, oh yeah, that's obvious to me now. That is a form of creativity in the sense that creativity more generally uh, is a collection of processes that um, will allow you to come up with something that isn't obvious. So if, if, uh, if something is obvious, then it can't be creative because everybody can do it. So we kind of value creativity as being something that is hard to come by. I mean, anyone can do it, but it's not something we necessarily do all the time. Uh, so creativity is a way to, to conceive of things that are at least potentially useful or interesting, but that are not obvious to begin with. Uh, and so there are other forms of creativity, and you know we can get into sort of a dual process model. Yeah, we might as well anytime you want because um, you know David's already mentioned it. Yeah. So do the dual process approach to creativity. It's actually not a single model. It's sort of a collection of related models. It's sort of a framework for thinking about it. So uh, if, if you want to think about it in terms of uh, Kahneman, Tversky, or Kahneman, at least talking about system one and system two. N nowadays, we talk about type one and type two. So type one processes are unconscious, associative, relatively automatic, and you just make connections unconsciously outside of awareness. And every once in a while, something will pop into awareness uh, in, and it'll be like an intuition or an insight. Whereas type two processing is slower, it's effortful, it's conscious, it's deliberate. It's what you do when I ask you to, in your head, add together the numbers 47 and 392. You don't, it's not just going to pop into your head unless you have some unique ability to do that. It's something you have to work through in a mm -hmm. conscious, deliberate way. So insights come from uh, the type one processing. The type two processing is when we sort of deliberately grapple with a problem. But, it, but insight also requires this incubation period after sort of hitting the wall, right? Of when you're working on your problem using a, a, a type two deliberate, effortful, conscious process. And then you got to, that's when you take the walk, take the shower, take the nap. Yeah, that, that's a common misconception. Mm. Uh, often insights do occur after a person has reached an impasse. They're stuck. They've exhausted the way that they're looking at the problem. And then they can take a break, go off, maybe take a shower, take a walk, and they have an insight. But sometimes insights occur without any particular problem. 
Sometimes you could be walking down the street and you have an idea. It's a great idea. It pops into your awareness and it's the solution to a problem you didn't even know you had. Right. Okay. Right. So insights do not have to, uh, do not depend on first having an impasse and being blocked. Often that's the way it happens. And those could be particularly memorable after the fact because it's this, you know, tension and release thing. It's you're stuck, you're tense, you don't know what you're going to do. You give up for a while. And then, ah, it comes to you. Right? But that, that you know, those ideas can come to you even when, I'll, I'll give you a, a concrete example that we have in the book. So in the uh, early 1940s, there was a uh, an engineer aboard a U.S. Navy ship. And his job was to uh, attach gauges and other instruments to springs uh, so that they would be sort of like shock absorbers so that when the ship was being buffeted about in, in choppy seas, the instruments would stay uh, more stable so that people could read them. So he was working with these springs. One got away from him and it started bouncing around the room and sort of like, you know, uh, back walking almost, right? And in that instant, he had the sudden insight. He could make a toy out of it. And after tinkering and refining, it became the slinky. So now, was he thinking about how do I come up with a design for a toy when that happened? No, he saw it. That triggered the insight, the aha moment, that that would make a great toy. Uh, so it would, he had not been uh, blocked on solving a problem. He had not reached an impasse. He just had a great idea. It just occurred to him from nowhere. So that that's an example of a situation where you can have an insight that solves a problem that you didn't even know you had. You say it came from nowhere, but he probably had memories of toys and memories of springs. Uh, and and Absolutely. we don't need to get into the Schachter right. type of uh, memory is creativity, is imagination and simulation. But um, yes. yeah, so that, um, so maybe not out of nowhere, but uh, but definitely not a problem of inventing toys for the sh for the crew. Right, <laughs> right. No, no, no ideas. No idea comes completely out of nowhere because uh, new ideas are based on. They have to be based on the knowledge you have. They can't be based on the ideas and knowledge you don't have. I yeah. mean, they have to be based. They have to be combinations of things that you already have in your brain in one way or another, um, in order to. Um, uh, I mean, you could combine two ideas, come up with a new idea, and then combine that with something else. But it still has to be based on the basic building blocks that you have. One of the things I was I, that I thought of reading your book, um, I, I recently did a, an episode about consciousness and you know the computational approaches to consciousness. And this is another sort of Wild West area. So I, I've kind of compared these in my head a little bit, consciousness and creativity. Part of the definition of insight is that it is a conscious moment, right? You are aware mm -hmm. of the of the insight, and just by definition of it being insight. Um, but the more we study the brain and its functioning, the more we realize that almost everything that we thought uh, was only conscious, a conscious process. There's a lot of unconscious processing going on that's basically doing the same thing. But it, this made me think: Ah, is this, you know, is this a function of a potential function of consciousness to to because when you have the uh, aha moment, the insight, uh, it is a solution, and you realize it's a solution. And is that a function of consciousness to to make one realize a potential solution, and then therefore be able to act upon that solution? That may very well be the case. Yeah, it may very well be the case. It, it, the study of uh, of insight uh, really started to take off in recent years with the the use of neuroscience methods, neuroimaging methods. And where we could look at what the brain was doing even when a person was not conscious of it. So, you know, when you have an insight, it pops into awareness in a way that's seemingly disconnected from the ongoing stream of thought because the brain had been working on that at some kind of unconscious level. When that process has run to completion, the contents or the result of that gets dumped into consciousness. That enables you, in some sense, to use that information, that insight, that idea for things to, to, to act on it in the world. But the, the ultimate example is like in dreaming, right? When we're ultimately, when we're ultimately not having wait, normal waking consciousness, and then basically what you are aware of is kind of this latent state and associations that, you know, that kind of, you know, brings it to the forefront. It's a state where we're, you know, and the brain is like operating with different, you know, oscillations, and that's what we're aware of. 
um, you know, as, as kind of you, you, you become more aware of what's that latent state that's going on under the hood because you're ultimately not waking. Yeah. And in fact, uh, you can have an insight while you're sleeping and it can wake you up. You wake up in the middle of the night with an idea or have you, has that ever happened to you? That's never happened to me. It, it's happened to me a, a, a lot of times. Oh, yes. I'm jealous. And, and yeah. uh, it does, it does happen. Um, well, maybe you shouldn't be jealous. If you get your insights during the day, that's better because you don't lose sleep that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't need so, to. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> when I get awakened by an idea in the, in the middle of the night, I mean, even if it's a bad one, I can't go back to sleep and I'm, yeah. you know, I'm stuck, I'm miserable the next day. Uh, but, but it does, ha- it, it, it absolutely happens. And a lot of people would, if they want to have an idea, they take a nap during the day to generate an idea. Uh, and uh, actually a, a, a little story was that uh, when we finished the manuscript for the Eureka Factor, the publication date was approaching and uh, every title that we came up with, potential title, our editor hated it. He just didn't like any of these titles. So we were getting nervous because my co-author, Mark Beeman and I, because uh, we didn't have a title and we didn't want them to push back the publication date. Uh, so uh, my wife, who's actually, she's a uh, event, she's an, uh, an editor, former journalist and writer. She said, well, I'm gonna use the, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna use the advice in the book. Yeah. She says, I'm gonna take a nap and I'll come up with the uh, the title. So she she went to bed. I, I went up up to bed in the bedroom. She fell asleep on the couch in the family room. And then like one or two in the morning, she comes and she wakes up. I have the title. I have the title. I said, yeah, yeah, well, tell me in the morning. No, 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 no. I've got the title, The Eureka Factor. And I said, sounds great. Tell, remind me in the morning. So in the morning, I emailed the editor and he liked it. And that's what we stuck with. But uh, it came to her while she was napping on on the couch and uh, a lot of people get ideas like that did you get did you go back to sleep after that oh right? yes absolutely yeah. oh, because absolutely. it wasn't your idea yeah you have another <laughs> idea generator if it, okay. if it was my idea I, I probably would have been up the rest of the night do you know i don't know if this is apocryphal or not but um i've told this story to my my younger cousins uh, apparently thomas edison would he'd be thinking about a problem and he would have his napping chair and he would hold these couple like large ball bearings in his hand and he'd relax in the chair and underneath him would be a metal pan and as soon as he relaxed enough that he was like drifting off the ball bearings would fall out of his hand hit the pan and make the the noise and make a racket and wake him up and that's how he would take his afternoon nap to generate his insights well you know that's really interesting i've heard that story too i believe that it is true but it's very interesting that edison did that because his public persona was of a person yeah. who worked through things in a very deliberate way. He did thousands of experiments to sort of home in on an idea and make it work. And he did, you know, he would say it's 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. And yet, you know, here he's using this method to, to come up with ideas out of out of the ether, out of the vapor, to, to generate insights. And he didn't really talk about that so much. So he, he wasn't fully forthcoming about how he came up with his ideas. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't imagine. Well, um, so, you know, in the book, um, in the Eureka Factor, aptly named by your uh, wife, you lucky man, that you talk a lot about the, the neuroscience EEG studies, fMRI studies, and a lot of just about the cognition um, around insights. So, and that might come back, but in the interest of time, um, let's, let's move on and talk about the, the creativity and jazz improv, uh, this mm-hmm. you know, series of studies that that you guys uh, have done recently here. So most creativity research uh, in the history, and I know it's kind of a new thing, you said, you know, it's like 20 years since the the neuroscience of creativity has started, but it seems like most most research on creativity has focused on sort of just the overall levels of creativity in individuals, as if creativity is some blanket thing that you just flip the switch or turn the dial up, and it's kind of the same thing in everyone. But uh, what you guys have been studying is uh, creativity as a function of of expertise in domains. And the reason why I asked about jazz to begin with is because you guys use uh, jazz improvisation as a more ecologically valid way to study uh, creativity. So, so in, in neuroscience a lot, you know, you have these animal models, right? So you, you know, let's say a mouse or a rat in a lab, and there's a lot of concern these days about, well, you know, a, a rat would never do a water maze task or a tea maze task in the wild. Um, so, so then, you know, we need ecologically valid tasks to actually get at, at the 
neural mechanisms underpinning what they might actually see in the wild. And it's weird to think of jazz improv as being an ecological, uh, ecologically valid task. But uh, is that pretty much accepted in, in the creativity uh, community? So jazz has gotten quite a bit of attention. It's I think it's gained a lot of interest because of the type of what jazz improvisation requires. Um, it's it's incredibly demanding mm. uh, co cognitively, and kind of when you when you just when you witness it at times, it seems almost as if it's it's magical. Like, how is it that these four people are are playing, and this is like made up on the spot, and actually they're together, and like how does that really happen at the highest levels? And so I think, um, as you pointed out, Paul, a lot of this is looked at saying, hey, create, this is like a type of creativity. Let's just say that all jazz improvisation is the same. And like there, there have been more and more studies kind of looking at jazz improvisation with that, hey, this is improvisation compared to X, compared to another task, a, memor a memorized melody or kind of some unique component, but not really, not really looking at the creativity of, of those moments and not just the creativity of those moments broadly, but how that creativity is achieved by the individual. And I think that what that really digs into is the distinction between creative products and creative process, which I think really was at the core of this work of looking at expertise. We did a set of three different studies. The first study was, as you joked in the beginning, be creative. Um, so that'll come back now. We brought in a bunch of keyboardists and had them improvise to a set of key, uh, novel uh, chord sequences they had never seen before. And halfway through the performance, after a number of takes, we asked them to be more creative. And the idea there was that, well, at least what I was thinking at the time was a bit naive, was that jazz musicians, you're trying to reach a level where you automatize those sensory kind of sensory memories and also kind of motor actions that will ultimately deliver those sounds and understanding how they will sound against different chords and different harmonies. And then you can be more free by understanding, mm -hmm. by, by having certain things, you know, routinized and habitualized. You can then take that vocabulary and understanding and apply it in a number of, uh, a wide range of in jazz, different songs, different chord changes as they come up, because you can un you can you you abstract those, those sequences into and chunk them into like you know broader areas where you can then kind of play around a little bit. But as it turned out, um, in that first study, you know, it wasn't just that when we asked people to be creative, people were able to flip a switch and say, okay, I'm gonna like enter my creative state now. Instead, what it did was it actually had a a, a differential effect among the population of pianists that we had in that study. So we started to look at one of the variables that had a really significant interaction with the condition of whether you were being asked to be creative or just playing normally, where there were really no instructions, it was just like kind of improvised. And it seemed to be that expertise um, combined with the instruction condition significantly predicted um, the quality ratings that we had obtained from uh, judges, which was mm -hmm. our way of, of measure, our way of a, a metric. We had four judges blindly rate improvisations. They weren't just dr judges off the street. These were music teachers around. Yeah, the they area. were they were jazz professionals yeah. uh, or teachers who had been playing or studying jazz for over twenty five years. And so, what happened really to get to the to get to the meat of it? Novices, when asked to be creative, they performed better. They had higher, significantly higher ratings. They improved more. They, they became more create, relatively more creative. They became relatively more creative to themselves. So that's a yeah, Paul. You pointed out a really important piece there is that this was within subject analyses. So rather than just taking each person and saying, okay, here's a take or two, what we're looking at was the difference that the experts would, you know, within each person would, you know, get better or worse depending on that condition. So they would relatively become better. And the experts, it hindered their performance. And it was significant at both ends of at both ends of the scale. You know, and so that led us to a lot more <laughs> many more questions. Um, but it pointed it pointed out something that we thought was really worth considering and it was a paradigm that uh, hadn't really been explored much is to see how expertise may ultimately affect the types of cognitive processes and the way that we approach behaviorally and metacognitively and, and neurologically a creative task. And so we set out after after that study to to look at two other 
studies, which I can dive into, or we can. Yeah, well, did, jump. is that when did you guys? Uh, did you? Because we we um, when I was a postdoc, we in, in a year or so after I left uh, is when the transcranial direct current stimulation started become becoming popular. You know, put a little sponge on your head, put a nine volt battery in there, and right. turn it on, and all of a sudden you're a concert pianist or whatever. Um, <laughs> so is that? I mean, and you know, and so. The, uh, a lab I was associated with. I never did any of this research, but they started doing it. We 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 started talking about you know trying to trying to do things you know with monkeys using this uh -huh. setup. And um, so anyway, uh, the transcranial direct current simulation kind of uh, exploded, I guess, in the past ten years. My my dates are off on these things, but um, so is that did that did you have these devices laying around, or is that when you thought, hey, let's buy some of these? And uh, <laughs> or here's the here's here's the real question: Were you guys using these in your homes beforehand for your own? <laughs> musical uh that's a serious <laughs> question though it really is because i know people you know so i did we didn't have um at the time a uh, neural neural stimulation um okay that wasn't that that wasn't the thought right right away but now i mean to diverge real quickly now there's like a there's like a whole field of in terms of the, the entrepreneurship side um oh, as oh you know because there's like, all kinds of neuroscience companies that are basically you know digging into the the, the you know tdcs and brain stimulation um, for you name, you name the task, um, you know, from, from creativity to athletic performance to make attention, you, make you a better lover. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, you'll, you'll, yeah, uh, everything. Um, so that, that you're, so you're saying T TDCS, that was the next, that was the next study, um, was right. to say, okay, now, and what was cool, what's cool about TDCS to me was when we were doing that was it kind of flips the, uh, neuroimaging paradigm on its head, right? So like, when you're doing a neuroimaging study, you are asking someone to do or a, different groups of people to do a task or two different tasks. And then you're looking at brain activity to determine what's the underlying uh, right. you know, neural, neural mechanisms for how this is occurring. And when you when you flip it around to brain stimulation, what you see is you say, OK, now we have because of past research, we have an understanding of what we think these brain areas are doing and how they're contributing to, in our in our case, creativity more broadly. So if we target these areas and ultimately uh, modulate the uh the electrophysiology of the brain can we see a difference in the output in the actual behavior of people next was trying to recruit <laughs> jazz pianists uh to you know to volunteer not volunteer they get paid a little bit but basically volunteer to have their heads zapped and come in for three sessions to do this and so what we did was we targeted uh the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex it might be worth backing up because We've already talked about the dual process model, but we haven't really talked yeah. about, you know, the, the the systems related to the the those two processes related to the dual process. Those being the default mode network, the executive function network, and then the salience network to mediate between them. I'm, you might want to just say a few words, uh, of like why you put it over the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to begin with, right? Well, the the uh, the system one, system two, or type one, type two distinction, the distinction between largely unconscious associative processes on one hand, system one, and uh, conscious, deliberate, uh, methodical processes, the system two, type two. That, that distinction uh, came before there were any neuroimaging studies. So neuroimaging studies have uncovered various uh, networks in the brain, such as uh, the executive network and the default mode network, et cetera. They don't, these things don't map onto each other theoretically that well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the executive, uh, network, sure, that's like type two, system two processing. The default mode network's not the same thing as type one, system one processing. Uh, the default mode network is the a collection of brain areas that are engaged when you don't have a test to perform or when the test you're performing uh, is very undemanding. So your your mind can wander, essentially. And when your mind wanders, it tends to think about various things like uh, thinks about the future, planning for the future, thinks about yourself. It may think about uh, past memories of interest, etc. It's usually centered around yourself, but it's conscious. A lot of it's conscious. There are probably unconscious aspects of it that go along with it. Whereas the type one, type two distinction Type one is unconscious processing. So the yeah, so those two ways of looking at it, uh, executive and default, don't really map on perfectly to the system one, system two. 
Hmm. And that that's uh, so that's one of the reasons when I mentioned dual process is, is a is a framework. It's it's not a single model. There's more than one model that talks about two different processes uh, like that. Uh, so in the salience network again, that's not incorporated into the type one type two thinking. Salience network uh, essentially a, a grabs your attention when something important or striking has happened, and it could be something. That happens externally, like you know, a car backfiring outside, or something internal, such as um, you know, a sudden idea, a sudden insight, or or a thought that grabs your attention. But so the idea of putting the the of, of stimulating the brain in at the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex uh, is so. So in in the first study, you said be creative, and uh, in that way, you you made creative people worse, or experts worse, uh, or not as they didn't improve as much. Whereas novices improved a lot, and they were so. In this second study, you thought, well, if we stimulate the brain uh, as a proxy for saying "be creative," we might get the same effect. Is that right? Well, let me let me interpose something here. So, uh, when you give a person uh, a command, a task, a goal, uh, goal activation, uh, uh, act, it, it uh, engages executive processing. So, if I say, you know, pick up that glass on the table, or something like that. Um, you have to deliberately engage mental processes that are involved in locating the glass, locating the table, um, you know, using your willpower essentially to, to follow through with it. It focuses your attention. Those are executive processes. Those are largely uh, a function of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, activity. There are other areas of the brain involved too, but dorsolateral prefrontal cortex uh, sort of the front on the sides of the of the brain, that is engaged when you have goal directed cognition, uh, and that so that that's the link between the two here. If you uh, stimulate dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we were hypothesizing or hoping or whatever that that would in some way uh, interact with this goal directed cognition that requires that part of the brain. I'll let I'll let Dave take the rest of it here. Yeah, the, the, we were trying to like really, I mean, get to the bottom. We had some different hypotheses around potentially what what was happening for the experts. Potentially, when they were asked the question, when they were asked to be more creative, you know, potentially when they were performing before because they were experts, they already kind of, you know, when they improvise, they improvise. They know what they're doing. And when asked to, you know, now focus on a new goal, well, I could have done a l number of things. It could have just the goal activation itself could have increased, uh, you know, kind of executive function. Um, type one processes, or it could have been something else like, you know, they were, they were thinking they were already creative and, and like, why, who are you? Some scientists like telling me to be more, to be more creative. Um, and that we're hypothesizing for the, on the other end, for the novices, you know, that ra rather than being limited by kind of, they were new and having this new task and kind of probably approached it at a more, you know, a simple level, just, you know, think outside the box and to take, take more chances and risks. And so even just, even just the question itself uh, was potentially the direction was, you know, interpreted very differently by those different, by those different groups and perceived in that way. So when we did the stimulation, you know, we were trying to get a sense of. But let me just interpose. So the, but the idea is that when you tell someone now be creative, you're giving them something extra to do. And that should engage executive processing it should engage dorsolateral prefrontal cortex because it's it's a uh, a conscious decision that they have to do something which should right. screw up the experts in their in their creative endeavor mm -hmm. screw up the experts right so right so in terms of so then we basically said with the with the brain stimulation study um there are two types of stimulation and then there's kind of a third type which is a control so you have you have a nodal stimulation, which is excitatory to right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Uh, cathodal stimulation is uh, thought to be inhibitory, but the effects aren't as reliable, especially in like kind of higher cognitive uh, tasks. And then the third condition is a sham condition, where basically you know you turn on the the TDCS, uh, you know, they feel something for thirty seconds, and then it shuts off because the, really the time when you feel anything is during the uh, the changing of of current. Um, be, w at, once it hits that steady state after about 30 seconds, uh, it's, it's unrec. You can't tell if you're, if you're in it or not. Actually, a, fu a funny, <laughs> a funny anecdote around that is we had one, uh, 
kind of uh, anxious, anxious pianist who came in uh, for this study. And it was during his uh, sham condition. And, you know, during some of the cog, we did, we did, uh, you know, br- we did basically the improv tasks. And after the improv tasks, we did a series of cognitive tasks and insight tasks, a creativity task, because we wanted to basically throw us. And when you, once you have some people who are willing yeah. to get brain stimulation, you throw a bunch of different tasks sure. to see like what else you can find, um, afterwards. So in the middle of, uh, in the middle of, of the, one of the insight tasks, the guy like took a fit and was just like, I can't, like, I can't think i can't do anything because I, I feel like my brain's been stimulated and messed <laughs> with and i'm sitting there as the experimenter you know i i can't you like can't say anything i, I can't even cry i can't even crack yeah. like a smile of seeing like oh man um this is like the sh- this is the sam this is the sham session so at least we know that that that's working um <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. to bring it back again, what we found was you know it was with a limited sample. It was only seventeen pianists, um, but we, what we saw was that the anodal stimulation significantly um, improved the performance of novices, and it significantly hindered the performance of experts. Similar to the the way that that, that what we had hypothesized was happening um, with the just the instruction of of, of the goal, um, you know, increasing executive function and which is helpful for a novice when you need to have that kind of like that control in what you're doing. Because if, if, if you relax that control, you're not there yet. Like you're, you're really going to just like fall off, especially with new, you know, with new stimuli, which is what these were. Um, and that's like a interest. That's a methodological decision that I've thought about uh, quite a bit. And in terms of the, you, you mentioned how accepted is jazz improvisation. I would say that while jazz improvisation is as a form of creativity generally is is of high interest to the academic community, there is repeated results on similar replicability on on these stimuli. I know that like the ones that I used were novel because we were trying to we had made them up to be, you know, they they're jet very much like jazz some like standards had like some two five ones and and like common progressions that if you're a jazz musician you would see but we were trying to eliminate the influence of um like specific um experience and like that's why we didn't give like blue bassa you know to people because we were trying to really focus on that you know this spontaneity of of performance Hmm. And so you know, with so that's I, that's something I've noticed. Like throughout the literature, everyone is kind of while they're saying that improvisation is is a useful task to look at. That people, including myself, in the studies, they're not looking at similar stimuli. Um, and I I'm not certain yet to you know what effect that might have on some of the results. But I think something that's important to think about. It, it seems like there's a lot of variables that it, that that can be pushed around and manipulated and it's the wild west there's a lot of questions it is, to the, be it is the wild west and answered so should we go on to the eeg finally sure. you put the eeg caps on yeah so actually let me just take a, a step back from it so fmri has great spatial resolution it can tell you it's okay it's pretty it's pretty darn and it's getting better all the time true true it's better than eeg uh, yes, gr- better spatial resolution, but it has a uh, fairly low temporal resolution. It's not great at telling you exactly when something's happening to the brain. And EEG has great temporal resolution. It's really good at telling you when something's happening in the brain. It's less good at telling you where something's happening in the brain. That said, the temporal resolution of fMRI is getting better all the time, and the spatial resolution of EEG is getting better all the time. Uh, so yes, we've been using uh, uh, an analytic approach that is best, you know, mostly identified with fMRI. We've been applying it to EEG to improve spatial resolution to get a better idea of where things are happening in the brain. So the the thing that's unique about this study is we used both the experts and non-experts, but we also compared the best and worst performances within experts and best and worst performances within. Uh, novices. So we, we we were able to sort of disentangle the relative contributions of expertise and other factors which could lead to a better or worse performance or more creative versus less creative performance. And uh, I, what we found, generally speaking, to sort of summarize it would be that novices, when they are giving their best performances, 
they're relying mostly on uh, frontal, particularly right frontal parts of the brain. And the experts, when they're giving their best performances, they're relying more on left hemisphere, left posterior parts of the brain. So what makes uh, a performance more creative versus less creative is different from what makes uh, a performance emanate from an expert versus a novice. So they're, yeah. they're, different, they're different processes that novices and experts use to get the most creativity out of, of what they're doing. What does that tell us about creativity? Is creativity one thing? I mean, it's, you know, okay. we need to, All right. go, go ahead. This okay, is a go favorite topic. Yeah. This is a favorite <laughs> topic. So this is one way to look at it. For the novices, improvisation was not yet a, a, a fully automatic or familiar task. For them, it's a, it was a relatively novel task. So their ability to improvise creatively depended on their ability to deal with this relatively novel task. Whereas for the experts, their ability to improvise creatively uh, depended on squeezing the most out of their automatic baked in processes. So if you're talking about novices, we're talking about a creative ability, which is the ability to deal with novel situations. If you're talking about do uh, experts in a particular domain, we're talking about creative processes. So what we have in this experiment is a distinction between creative processes and creative products, I should say. So the experts, they're the ones who give the most creative products using automatic processes. The novices are the ones who um, have the creative processes, if you define creativity in terms of the ability to deal with novel situations. This makes an inter interesting prediction that, you know, we could try in other experiments, is that the novices who gave the most creative performances, if they have a general ability to deal with novel situations, they should be good at dealing with other kinds of novel situations that have nothing to do with music. Whereas for the, the experts, the ones who gave the most uh, creative expert performances, yeah. since those are based on a specific domain, specific baked in automatic musical improvisation process, they might not be very good at being creative in other domains besides music. We don't know. It's just a hypothesis. I mean, might this interact with uh, intelligence axes as well? So I know that creativity and intelligence are not perfect, don't perfectly co-vary, but uh, what you were just saying sounds like novices that are good at uh, handling novel situations may score higher on whatever intelligence. Fluid tests, intelligence. You know, fluid yes. intelligence. Yes. yes. So the, the, there is a, uh, uh, the, the whole topic of intelligence research is its own yeah. uh, fairly dicey area. Wild but, West. Yes, definitely it's a Wild West. Um, but there is one type of intelligence that's been isolated through intelligence tests called uh, fluid intelligence, which is the ability to deal with novel situations, but also to deal with, to sort of think on your feet. So if I just, you know, toss an unfamiliar problem in your lap, you have to solve it. You need your fluid intelligence. You can't rely on past experience very much to deal with that problem. That's very much like what we're talking about in terms of the novice creativity. It could be that the relationship between intelligence and creativity has to do with this ability to deal with novel situations. Uh, again, we're getting right to the 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 leading edge and beyond yeah. the leading edge of what of the research that's been done but the, so these are these are uh, speculations at this point uh, but the ability to deal with novelty may be what links creativity with intelligence this is so fun these topics are so fun the wild west is so fun to to be in before we wrap up the the eg side i'd like to add like yeah. a little a little a little piece there i don't want to give a sense that this is like an all or nothing phenomenon where, you know, if I'm an expert, I'm only using type one processes. And if I'm a novice, I'm only using type two, because it's really about like, it's about the balance and the function of those processes. So for example, I, I'll give, I'll give an example of like a, an, an expert. So if I'm playing and let's say that, you know, I, I play wrong notes or something alerts my attention, something weird is going on, right? 
if I if I am grooving before that, and let's say I'm I'm pretty much with like type one processes dominant, and I'm kind of like automated and feel like everything's going well. Um, and it kind of relates to getting to flow that like how that feels, the phenomenology of it. Um, but something goes wrong, right? You can imagine that now I am I am focused, right? I am now attending more consciously to yeah. to the to to messing up, to screwing up, and. I think there's the distinction there. I mean, we haven't tested this yet, but my, my guess is that there's this uh, ability to cognitively switch um, where, you know, you know what it feels like with the experience and tap into that phenomenology of past experience of like, okay, this is what it is to be comfortable. And like, here's how I, here's like what that is. Um, and being able to go up and back between um, these states, between kind of type one and then kind of going back to and, and switching to a more, uh, laid back kind of less top down control approach. And I would say the same on the the same thing on the other side. Um you know, I've been on both sides like so as a musician who's new who's maybe newer to jazz, you can almost feel like you accidentally ended up in a place where you like sound better than you are. Sure, yeah. Uh I'm sure we've all had those moments whether if we're lucky it's when we were performing, but usually it's like when we're practicing in our room and we can't recreate it when we have other pressures like an audience or other people judging us, which is like an ensemble and social, you know, evaluation and all those things. I think the same thing happens there is like and that's again indicative of the flow state, which maybe will be the next thing we dig into. But like once you become you, you fall into this into this place where things are going really well and you can play automatically and just like, you know, you're responding to the other sounds around you, and that's this very bottom up um, another way to think about like not having that controlled approach is called bottom up versus top down. Where bottom up mm-hmm. is where that's where we're really responding in a more uh, sensory s- sensory way, where we're not kind of evaluating and judging or or even planning necessarily the next thing that's going to happen. And then you kind of all of a sudden start to think about how things are going really well. And then as soon as you start to do that, you know, especially for less experienced players, that breaks you out of it, and you don't know how to get back. Yeah. And right. so it's really about I think. Which which types of processes are are, are, are dominant um, between these two groups of, of of musicians, experts, and novices, rather than trying to think of it as a, an all or nothing phenomenon? We started talking in the beginning about divergent and convergent processes, and th- and the dual process it's, itself. It's like you have this little stage where you're um, let's say let's say you accidentally randomly walk into a place where you you realize oh this is good right. Then so you kind of randomly did that, so that's almost uh, divergent thinking pro- process, right? And then you realize it's good, and that's like a convergent. This is a good solution to where, wherever I ended up. Uh, and then, but then it seems to like, and there's you know the uh, network uh, functionality experiments where the default mode network and the executive function network are functionally connected more during creative processes, and it just seems like a very, especially in music, uh, a very dynamic switching like you're just talking about how to switch between them and i don't know how you capture that in for stimulating direct current simulation you can't capture the, that uh the dynamic aspect of it and with eeg the timing is better and, and you can see the the power in the oscillations right Rel- uh, relative to different stages but then you'd have to like time it really well i don't know so i i just kind of had that thought of how important dynamics might be and switching between and the rate of switching between, how that might be a function of mm-hmm. different expertise. I'm sure you've thought about all of this. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, yes, ideally. I mean, we have not done these analyses, sure, and, in, sure. and this will be figure out, uh, hard to figure out how to do these analyses. But we'd like yeah. to determine whether uh, these two states are uh, blended or whether they're switched, whether it's a discrete switch back and forth. Uh, or whether it's just uh, you know a, a gradation of the mixture right. of the two. Yeah. Um, if there's a switching, what's the time scale involved? Uh, that's that's all stuff that we'd be very interested to to look at in the future. Uh, but you know what we've done so far, it's 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 a first cut. It's a rough cut uh, to show that these these two types of states exist. And now we have to see whether they are in fact really discrete states or continuum or, I mean, I suspect that to an extent they're a continuum in the sense that there are degrees of control that a person can exert uh, or degrees of self-awareness while they're otherwise automatically performing. Yeah. But in some people, that might not be the case. In in some people, any degree of uh, exerted self-awareness or self-control might cause some people to choke. 
So, you know, you find th- this phenomenon where a uh, could be a baseball player or a tennis player, they have a dry streak and, you know, the baseball player is striking out a lot or whatever. Um, and then some coach says, oh, no, you're, you're not, you know, it's swinging just right. You should pay more attention to exactly how you hold the bat or the racket. Then they become self-aware and self-conscious. Yeah. And then they start choking. And it, and it actually exacerbates the problem and, and uh, makes the, the dry streak last longer. And because they're exer- exerting too much self-consciousness, too much self-control when they really, which they should be doing, is just letting their automatic processes take over and do their best that way. That, that speaks to performance anxiety, I think, in almost any domain. Yeah, I, one of my one of my worst haunting memories, and this is sound, you know, people have had much worse experiences, but I remember in, I was in a basketball game in my you know middle school or something. I we were behind. I stole the ball. I got fouled. I, I made the layup, and I went to the the free throw line. They called it an intentional foul because a guy really karate chopped me. And, and I, I had just seen my grandparents walk into the audience and sit down, you know, and I, I was like, really, I could not get them out of my mind. And I, I, I missed both free throws and they were like, they had no spin on the ball. It was like the ugliest shot you'd ever seen. And it still haunts me because I choked. It was performance anxiety. So, oh. yeah. It happens to, the, to everyone. So I I I want to say I don't know if I, just, I have a friend I have a similar story I thought I wasn't sure if you were going that route I have a, I have a buddy of mine he's not he's a musician uh, he's been in bands with me for years he's not exactly uh, athletically uh, oriented let's say and when you told your story it just reminded me of him he has this story where like he he like really had never scored a basket and he was put in the game and he like ended up with the ball this is enough for his anxiety but he ended up with the ball and he was like really excited started running down the court and shot it up wrong basket wrong basket yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you mentioned flow states. And uh, John, you wrote in, in the Eureka Factor, you talk about one of the one of the features of insight moments is that they're accompanied by this joy, right? Of, oh, I, I found the solution and it's changed how I have thought about the problem. And people talk about flow states in the same way that that's like the best state you can be in. And I'm at my happiest when I'm rarely, you know, rarely does it happen. But when I realize, oh, I was in flow state, uh, you know, it, it really is a joyful moment. So how does this relate to flow states? That's a good question. And I can speculate only, really. Uh, so an in, when an insight happens, an aha moment, an idea pops into your mind all of a sudden. And traditionally or classically, we think of these aha moments as being these discrete ideas or uh, a new way of looking thing things. But you could think of what happens in expert improvisation as being like that. So you could think of an expert who just sort of turns it on and lets it happen and uh, is is just sort of improvising based on these automatic processes. You could think of that as an insight or an aha moment that's extended in time. We don't know for sure whether this is, you know, it, it's really the same thing. We don't know whether uh, that kind of time extended improvisation is really the same kind of thing as an insight or not. I suspect there's a lot of overlap. And that may be what a flow state is. I mean, we have, we have some research in the works. Uh, we don't, ha- we haven't published it yet. I'll let Dave talk a little bit about what we've done so far. Uh, in, in a few months, we'll probably have a lot more to say about it. Uh, but I, I, I think that may be what it is. Dave, do you want to add to this about, uh, about flow states? Sure. Uh, you know, flow is, I mean, anecdotally, especially in, in music and in music and sports, a lot of the time we think that the best moments in our lives are, you know, when we're like kind of relaxing and, and, and we're and we're passive. But at the end of the day, when I look back at, at the things that, that like have had the most the most meaning, it's it's when I've worked my ass off at something and really like tr- extended what I ever thought was possible or what I could, what I could ever kind of like know. And like, ultimately, whether that's a musician or whether that's a scientist or whatever your domain, there's tons of opportunities there to, um, you know, basically immerse yourself in something that like you really care about. Flow is the uh, subjective experience. It's what you experience um, doing the activity. And right. So talk about the things that are hard to quantify. Yeah. You know, you think, if you think, <laughs> If you think creativity is hard, um, 
flow is even harder. And then we we make it a, a distinction beyond that. And I know in the in the literature about creative flow. Okay. Because you know you so creative flow is you know when you're performing something that ends up you know it's it's considered creative. It's not you can be in flow uh, hike you know walking right. You could be in flow deeply immersed reading something. Um. So the the creative flow has a slight uh tweak on that. To me, while you can experience flow when you're when you're performing. Um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of external pressures there that you know sometimes you'll maybe sometimes other than others you'll be better at uh, you know inhibiting your response to those things. But it's about the ongoing. I think you can experience flow the same as if you're practicing scales to a metronome mm. or you know even though even in the most mundane tasks. Because there's a there's a, one of the core dimensions of flow and the components. There's there's nine. I'm not gonna li- I'm not gonna kind of like list them off about what flow is in terms of how we define it. And the first one that's usually mentioned is about the challenge and skill balance. And I think that speaks a lot to just the experience of deciding to. It has to do with like either a craft or developing like a discipline mm-hmm. and a set of going about something that you care about. Craftsmanship. Yeah, craftsmanship, and it's not just. You know, doing creative things is is nice to you know. He's saying I'm I'm making here's this contribution. Here's something new. But I think it's about the day to day evolution of how you you know, and something that's in, intrinsic meaning that you decide is important to you. Um, and so with with the jazz study, what I've noticed in the in the the very few papers that have been published with the neuroscience of flow is the papers that are out there on this work um don't um, really talk about or don't examine a topic of interest of the participants, right? So challenge and skill is, as I mentioned, one of the top dimensions and components that people cite as being important to flow, but it's not the only piece, right? So, you know, a common task that will be used for a flow experiment is like uh, a game of Tetris, for example, or which some people may have different, you know, like sure. some people may prefer more than those. Another common task for flow is math problems where there is a algorithm or program in place where you set your baseline for how good you are and it basically it doesn't push you too hard and it doesn't make it too easy it's about balancing those things based on what i read about flow and then seeing the neuroscience literature we wanted to build flow into this study it's really great to understand the the neurological processes and it's awesome to evaluate products when you're studying creativity but this guy, and this goes back to the diversion thinking criticism is that what does it feel like for the person? Are there any psychological constructs that exist out there that would really encompass what this feels like when people are being created? What's the closest thing? And and flow is what jumped out at us. Mm. Um, so basically, just in the, in the initial research, um, we just in our behavioral model before we looked at the EEG, the EEG we focused on expertise and we focused on quality. But we just we just built a model to say what other factors will predict how high of a quality improvisation you have, and so there were really two main factors in that in the EEG study, which we didn't mention before. The first one was expertise, and the second one was flow, and the flow states were basically the way we gathered that information was after performers did their takes, they they saw the changes back up on a the screen, they went through them, they asked how familiar were you with these. And how well did you perform and took flow surveys about about each of the stimuli? You know, we thought, okay, maybe flow only happens for experts. And so there would be, again, an interaction. But basically, flow, regardless of of expertise level, seemed across the board that people were experiencing flow. um, That was leading to improved um, quality ratings. So that had never really been kind of shown before. And what we're really trying to, to get a sense of in this new work is we're trying to get a sense of the relationship between um, how the self evaluates things, how that's related to external observers' evaluation, what the picture is there, and then also trying to disentangle really what does flow look like between, you know, again, what is the difference between flow for an expert and flow for a novice? Just like creativity, um, so that's something we haven't really talked about was there's different kinds of creativity. It just goes back to the novice and expert breakdown. Uh, they talk about the four kind of four levels of creativity um i could break it down like there's you know there's like a child who discovers who's finger painting for the first time right as like 
you, you can be creative finger painting and then you and you have Picasso who's you know making you know an eminent creation and the kind of there's everything in between right and flow while you can talk about this creativity at different levels we don't really have an understanding of neuroscientifically um how flow is related in terms of the the phenomenological experience um between those different um kind of levels and so that's what we're trying to kind of get mm. a sense of is disentangling these seemingly overlapping uh constructs that are hard to define that are hard to define so that's that's work that you're doing right now that's what's on the docket these days yeah that's what that's um, what we're working on right now we're getting some really cool results so far well, so we have, um, I know that we're up against the clock here, but this is ostensibly a podcast about neuroscience and AI. So I would be uh, amiss not to ask you guys to speculate a little bit. It is hard for me to think of an insightfully thinking robot, right? I mean, does that even make sense? To, do we have a per enough purchase on this that we could start to build, you know, computational models of creativity of, of, of insight what would it even mean for an AI agent to have an insight for instance you know well, I, I, I can speculate about that so one way to think of, of insight is it's a way to leapfrog across complexity you could be trying to compute something in a brute force fashion by looking at all the possibilities say in a chess game a computer can compute all the possibilities several moves deep and um, come up with a uh, pick the best solution. Insight may be a way to leapfrog that complexity so that you don't have to compute all the possibilities. If that's what insight is, then it behooves us to, to figure out what the computational mechanism is and see if we can implement it in an artificially intelligent system to either uh, enable that artificial intelligence system to compute things more quickly by leapfrogging across irrelevant possibilities or by getting more primitive hardware to behave like, as if it's more sophisticated hmm. hardware to get more bang for the, the hardware buck. So that, that may be what insight is. Now, creativity more generally though, that's another issue because we as humans call something creative because it seems creative to us. us yeah. That doesn't mean that it seems creative to a, a machine. If there were no humans, but there were machines, would there be such a thing as creativity? Right. Uh, maybe not. I mean, I don't think machines would call each other creative. So creativity, in a way, it's in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes the creative solution is something that works really well and and we can point to that objective fact that oh that's a creative way to get this test done to solve this problem or or whatever that's the objective marker but to call something creative itself in a way it's a subjective judgment now there may be ways to objectify this maybe through uh, uh by modeling it in in a, in a bayesian fashion so the creative solution is the solution that is highly improbable given the base rates. It, it's mm. the, the most unexpected solution or idea given what is already known. That might be an objective way to, uh, to define creativity uh, in a way that a, that a machine would understand it and appreciate it, perhaps. It has to still be a solution, though. It has to still be useful. Yes, right. So, so for example, one of the uh, definitions that some researchers use of creativity is that something has to be, you know, novel and useful. Well, the useful part I disagree with because there are such things as brilliant failures, great ideas that everyone acknowledges are creative, but they just don't pan out. That doesn't make them make them less creative. So, this to to a machine, a failure would be a failure. Probably, I mean, there might be a way to compute non-obvious failures in a meaningful way that would they could still be labeled as creative? I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we're getting way beyond anything. I mean, I'm not an, an AI expert by any means, but we're going way beyond anything that I've heard of in, in, in the literature at this point. Yeah. Um, I'll piggyback. Uh, I, I, I'm, I agree with a lot of, that, a lot of what John just mentioned. Um, I think the approaches 
I'm not an AI expert either. Actually, at, at Secret Quarter, I was I had brought this I brought some of these questions to my colleagues at Secret Quarter who are actually building the artificial intelligence and the and the neural networks that that we use. I think it's it's kind of a, a relevant example, and it seems like generally that people are, are tapping into the the different stages of creativity in networks like in gans ultimately right there's this ideation and generative network and then there's discriminative networks that ultimately they're trying to kind of pass off as as looking similar to a training set and like so that's basically a similar model in 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 figuring out a game like chess or in some types of math proof examples we've seen where just by coming up with with lots of different ideas ultimately you can train a model then to kind of like whittle it down that is kind of the approach people are taking, and it seems to be guided by by the neuroscience and underlying our understanding of cognition and creativity. But at the same time, the architecture and how people are are building um, and tweaking parameters and like you know, although we say we say this now it's AI, it's learning this. There are creative people who are using the tools that are put in front of them to try to uncover um, you know, maybe solutions that would never be found. Um, but if not for the creative people who are thinking about how to use this tool and apply it in this in this certain way um, yeah. and using their domain skills, then potentially, I, I don't know how maybe the art, artificial intelligence would be able to self-program at some point. So there's there's the agent, there's like an agent um, there with like a focus and a, a problem that they have conceived of and a, 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 prob, a problem space. I'll give the, I'll talk about kind of secret chord in a way of something of like, in terms of uh, our, our algorithm doper of how we think about like AI being creative. Um, so going back to like familiar surprise in music is like, okay, we see a lot of generative uh, models um, and things like that are happening out there, like style transfer um, algorithms where, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one of our engineers did something really cool. He took the uh, Imperial March and he blended it with, uh, with the star spangled banner and made this like brand new music piece. Um, I remember I heard that I was like, Oh, this guy's a genius <laughs> has to work here one day. Um, but if you put things into a model, like, like in terms of doper uses for, for evaluating and giving insights about the like future value of music by putting in components, things like surprise, um, you know, because I come into I come into this from the the angle of creativity research or a musician, and so my uh, my initial inclination was to was to be like ew, like no, I don't want I don't want this algorithm in in music creation because it's gonna just it's it's just gonna make things even worse. But like as I learned more and more about about really how artificial intelligence is used in music and beyond. It's really about learning from previous examples and then generating new ones. So the tricky thing, you know, in music, most algorithms, A, are, are generating new things that sound familiar to what's happened before, especially in like that, in terms of this is dancey, like something gets a tag for a song, like just one word, and you say, okay, give me thousands of songs that sound dancey, and now I can create a song that also sounds dancey. You can create millions of songs that sound dancey. But the question is now is saying, okay, well, will any of those produce enjoyment? Are any of those actually good compared to the past? And how do you evaluate that? And so even in our even in our research, we found that if you algorithmically generate like an ideal range of surprise in a feature, let's say harmony, there was a key component we produced, okay, here's X songs with this perfect pattern of, of chords that has the ideal harmonic surprise according to, you know, past songs. And there, there's this human component that was required that just because you do something that was surprising doesn't mean that it sounded musical necessarily. And so there was this like, this curation process that I see happening across domains where, you know, it's, it's useful to come up with, with different ideas and to do a lot of the, the, uh, the brute brute force work whether it's you know making a soundtrack or putting a uh, scenes from i just read about uh putting a movie trailer together uh, based on that watson was doing based on like kind of previous horror movies and that was a cool application and you know it can save hours and hours of work of of just like that you know the initial just like putting things together and and, and bringing clips to the front but then kind of like finalizing that to be something that appeals to other human beings um, hmm. I think is a level of insight that uh, that AI doesn't yet have to be able to, it might fit certain parameters, but ultimately it's going to generate some examples that are good and some examples that maybe aren't as good. If I could add something here. So I, I think a lot of this comes down again to the distinction between creative products and creative processes. Okay. So uh, an AI can produce 
products that people will consider to be creative. You can, you know, input uh, a bunch of great paintings into a convolutional neural network and get it to come up with a new painting that's sort of like the ones that were inputted. So yes, there can be that form of, of uh, artificial creativity. Uh, however, if you think in terms of, let's go back to our, our, uh, uh, our jazz study, the EEG study. If you think of creativity, in terms of the ability to deal with uh, novel situations. People can do that. That's a lot harder for artificial intelligence. That gets to the issue of, uh, you know, sort of the, the holy grail of general artificial intelligence that can, can uh, cope with novel situations. That's a real challenge for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. as I understand it. And it's something that people are particularly good at. So I think if you're talking about the creative processes, the ability to deal with novelty, that's more of a challenge for AI than would be the ability to produce creative products in a specific domain, such as jazz or painting or poetry or what have you. So you're, so you're saying it's going to be easier to build flow in AI, expert AI agents, than it will be to figure out how to uh, teach novice AI agents uh, how to uh, deal with various situations? Well, it, uh, it will mimic flow, except that these AI agents won't have the conscious experience of flow. So you said. Uh, so it, yeah, well, I, I, I don't see any reason to think that they, right. they, uh, they will anytime in the foreseeable future, unless someone can build an artificial human brain that has whatever properties uh, uh, enable it to experience consciousness and emotion and, and pleasure, emotion and all of those other things. And for all we know, in terms of the creative processes, the ability to deal with novelty, since those in humans tend to be uh, deliberate, conscious type two processes, it may be an artificial general intelligence would need to be conscious to do that. We don't know. Again, this is, this is uh, the bleeding edge of, of what's known here. Go ahead, David. I, I don't know if you're going to add something there. I mean, the only other piece, I, it goes along with, with consciousness. And I, th I feel like the personal experience and, and emotions that we assign to, you know, different moments and experiences vary greatly by person to person based on what they have dealt with. And ultimately, those emotions play an important role in, in the saliency of, of certain memories. Um, and ultimately, the things that are the most available, readily available. And so, by having such a, a, a breadth of, of human experience in a physical world, I think without that um, axis that incorporated into, into like artificial intelligence, that that is quite a distinction from the human experience, mm. of course, which maybe doesn't um, always play out in things that are very logic-based, like a game of chess, but in terms of expanding into novel situations and 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 I and thinking about creativity as as the process, um, I think that we're quite a bit off from that. Guys, uh, I could I, I could talk about this all day with you, and th so thanks for going so long with me already. And I wish we had another two hours here, but um, I wish you both good luck, John, with the continued research, and and David, good luck with the company. Do you recommend starting yeah. a company to uh, previous <laughs> academics? Well. Um, it, depends the, it depends what the company. <laughs> it depends. It depends what the company is. Like I wanted to keep do. I wanted to keep being a music neuro. I wanted to keep being yeah. a music neuroscience researcher, and I happen to be. I would have like the background of presenting and speaking about and presenting the company, and have like a lot of business people in my life. My father mostly, who taught me kind of how to run an organization and kind of set a work ethic and and things like that, and the pieces came together and now instead of just doing instead of going to do research and at the end of the day you know i don't really own it now we're trying to make something that it's we're, we're pushing the needle still doing research on the neuroscience music enjoyment applying for you know for grants to continue this research and doing more neuroscience and so it's really it's the company that if i if i was someone and i was passionate about my research and i got the opportunity to to create a company around that with with people who i loved working with and putting together like a awesome team of just you know just individuals who are passionate 
I graduated, not, not to make this too long-winded, but I graduated from every single person who I said I studied music neuroscience to. When I went to grad school, they said, what are you going to do after that? And I said, I have no idea, but getting your PhD probably puts you in a better position to do something. And it ended up that now I'm, I'm at this place where now it's a place where like, hopefully neuroscientists of, of music and engineers who study music, it's a place where they can come where it's creating a new industry that, that never existed. John, you're going to drop it all, walk away, start a company? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? All right. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought about it. <laughs> yeah. Sundays more than others, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It depends on the weather that day. Yeah. But who knows? You never know. Well, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. It was our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair